the entrepreneurial journey podcast we're talking business and building a culture that's kick-ass where we make it happen grab your seat let's have a blast at the entrepreneurial journey podcast okay welcome to the entrepreneurial journey podcast today i have mark riddell with me which is how his granny pronounces it so that's what we're using today hello mark how are you I'm very well, Rebecca. How are good. you? Yeah, I'm really good. Thank you. Uh, we had a little technical hitch there, which was uh, appropriate because you are the MD of M3 Networks. And I'm guessing you spend a lot of your time saying, have you switched it on and off again? <laughs> yeah, it's the old cliche. But, you know, the funny thing is, is that it's the basic troubleshooting, right? You know, unless you've turned it off and on, there's no point trying to find the more complex solution quite often it's the simple things you know why does that work oh how long have you got okay (laughs) (laughs) really the way computers work you know you you load up a program it stores that in memory or in the ram you know most people be familiar with these terms Um, and sometimes computers kind of just get themselves into a kind of funny turn and they just need a reboot because it flushes out all of that stuff and it starts Uh... fresh Okay. Um, so yeah, it's a simple solution to a lot of things, you know, it's like, I don't say it too much in business now because you know, I'm not sitting on our help desk. We've got no. a team of people that are way better than me to do this, these things now, but I do find I'm saying that a lot to my kids at home when they come to me, dad, my tablet's not working, dad, YouTube's not working. I'm like, okay. And of course it's, if I just turn it off and on for them, they think I've worked some sort of voodoo magic and oh, it works now. And then I get praise for it. So <laughs> And it's not true. You've literally just turned it off and on. Cool. Yes. Now, um, I was looking at your LinkedIn profile um, and you've been in computers a very long time. Yes, quite a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, probably got into computers, I guess, the old school way, mm-hmm. um, which was kind of, so my first computer was a Commodore 64. So if anyone mm-hmm. remem- remembers those, yeah, with old tape drive and stuff. Yeah. And um so yeah, I kind of got into that, started doing a little bit of coding programming stuff, you know, at a, probably when I was about 10 year old, I think, probably about that age. Um, and then once I kind of got into like my mid-teens, that's kind of the era where more people were starting to have PCs in their house. And of course it was like, you know, the knock on the door at like quarter past six when you're still eating your dinner and the next door neighbor's like, oh, um, can Mark come and have a look at my computer? Because people kind of, you know, you, of course your parents always big you up, right? Oh yeah, Mark's great with computers. He can fix anything. So I'd be around there working for free, fixing people's computers in the evening. Um, and then it kind of just went, that kind of went from there. That's kind of how it started. And then okay. people started giving me money for doing it. They're like slipping me like 20 pound here and there because I'd fixed their computer. Um, and that's kind of really where it started from. Kind of got into to IT like that. Um, so you fell into it, and and at the time, were they doing computer science at school or not? No. Well, there was um, there was computing at school when uh-huh. I was there. However, it wasn't really computing in terms of like technical support stuff. It right. was more about like how to use spreadsheets and write letters right. on a computer. You know. Um, I mean, when I started high school, I don't think the high school had any computers. I remember when they got their first Macs in the library and that kind of stuff. So, um, so it wasn't a huge, wasn't a huge thing back then, no. All right. Um, you can hear my dogs in the background. They're going to start fighting any minute now. Obviously, <laughs> they've been really quiet for quite a while, and because I'm recording now, they're going to have a massive fight. But we're just going to have to go with it. You run That's a right. podcast. Yes. Uh, what's your podcast about? So the podcast is called Texas, which was kind of my idea of taking the word um, technology and success and smashing them together. Um, because that's really what, for me, technology is about. It's, it's not just cool technology, which is quite nice. You know, if you're into gadgets and stuff, yeah, technology for technology's sake is quite cool. But in business you know technology is a tool um Mm. but it's a great enabler you know it's probably one of the things that can really set your business apart Mm. from competitors make you more efficient um so yeah i like the fact that we can communicate you know technology to business owners and it decision makers so that they understand the technology they should have like the essential technology Mm. but what else is out there that can actually 
um, make your business a lot better. You, you can't run. I mean, I often say to businesses, you know, even the shop that's selling cupcakes is a tech business because it needs tech to run the business. Um, a lot of our listeners are, are on their journey running their own businesses. Some have started, some are towards the end of their journey. Um, what what do they need to keep their eye on? What What's coming up over the horizon that can impact small to medium-sized enterprises, either for good or bad? Well, of course, cybersecurity um, okay. is a huge um, issue for all businesses at the moment. In fact, it's actually becoming more of a, a an issue for smaller businesses um, because, you know, everyone's aware of what's going on with, like, the big cyber stuff. You see, mm -hmm. like, BA and Marriott Hotels and everyone else in, in, in the news, right? But we don't really see small businesses making no. the news. Um, the big companies have actually got much better at cybersecurity. You know, they've all seen the other big companies, like, I mean, Uber's, you know, it was a recent one as well. Um, and they're all investing in it and they're all becoming a lot more resilient um, to attacks, not paying out ransoms and things like that. Okay. So the attackers are like, right, these big companies are actually getting really switched on. Like they are not really falling for this and we're not really making the money there anymore. But the smaller companies don't have the budgets. They're not focused mm. on cybersecurity because so many small businesses are still got that mindset of, well, it never happened to me. No one's targeting me. You know, why would anyone be worried about little old me over here running my small business, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, cybersecurity is, is you know, is a massive, massive problem. In fact, actually, I heard someone say earlier that people don't really look for IT support companies anymore. People are looking for cybersecurity specialists that can uh, do the IT support too, which is a really right. kind of turning on its head. Um, oh. uh, and so that's, I think, where where we're kind of excelling in that area. Oh, okay. I didn't realize any of that. So how can a small business protect themselves? What practical steps can they take? The funny thing with cybersecurity is we talk about like cybersecurity culture. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you're running a small business, if, if the owner MD of the business isn't really worried about, you know, risks or the very risk averse, um, then that's going to filter down, right? Mm -hmm. um, staff are going to follow the practices of the owner. So they see right. the owner, you know, not being very cyber conscious or really, or if they hear the owner saying things, ah, you know, cyber is not a problem. It's never going to happen to us and things like that. What's going to happen when your, your employees are sitting there looking at their email, try to decide whether the email they're looking at is a real email or if it's a phishing attack. Mm. You know, their attitude to cybersecurity is going to mirror the owner right um um but it really comes down to actually one acknowledging that well there's a risk right mm -hmm. uh, cyber risk is just like any other business risk you know health and safety risks fire risks whatever other risks your business is facing it's just a risk right um but i think it's just been seen as an IT thing, right? Ah, mm -hmm. oh, cyber, it's just IT. And of course, we outsource our IT to an IT company. So then there's an assumption that the IT company is doing something, you know? Uh, um, people don't really okay. don't know what that thing is. But yeah, they must be doing something with security, right? And I'm like, well, you know, so really the question I ask a lot of people is, well, when did you last sit and have a discussion about cybersecurity with your IT company? Okay. Because if you're not talking to them about it, you really think they're just doing things in the background that you don't know about. Right. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's it's a big problem, um, and it's one of the reasons I think why a lot of our new, you know customers come to us because they find out at some point their IT company doesn't have cyber covered, and they want someone that has more of a specialist focused on on cyber. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So when, at what point in your career did you go, I know I'm going to set up my own business? Because you're getting paid, you know, by neighbours, by friends to fix computers and things like that. What what was the catalyst that you thought, right, I'm, I'm going to turn this into a business? So... Yeah, I've I've been in IT for a long time, but I didn't mm -hmm. go straight into IT when I left school. Um, okay. 
I actually went into hospitality and, and I worked in hotels for a couple of years. I think that's, right. and that's where I learned like the customer service background side of things. Um, but I always knew I was going to work in IT uh, somehow. So after mm-hmm. a couple of years, um, quit, quit my job, went and studied my computer networking degree. And that was three years. So then that took me to 2005 when I graduated. Next two years after that, I worked self-employed. So I was then taking what I was doing for the friends and family thing and actually making a go of it, kind of doing it my, my own thing. Okay. So, you know, it's home, home PC repair stuff. Um, after a couple of years, um, I started doing some, I used to do some web development stuff as well. Um, yeah. And so I started doing that for a company based in Dundee. I uh, eventually ended up working for them full time. Uh, and then that business um, went out of business, actually. Um, and myself and my other two directors, founders at Setup M3, we were made redundant together. Oh. And so we didn't really have the luxury of going, right, we're going to start our own business and everything else. For us, starting a business was complete kind of like, <laughs> you know, the opposite way around than what most people would do it, right? It wasn't a conscious thing. Um, we never knew it was kind of going to happen until it happens. And and some people don't, you know, believe when I say that, you know, the d- I was made redundant on the 17th of August in 2009. M3, if you look us up, our, our date of incorporation was the 18th of August. Yeah. Like the next day. Yeah. Um, and it literally happened that quickly. You know, we sat around my colleague Mary's kitchen table, decided what we're going to call ourselves, filled out the forms, had a few more beers, and then that was it. <laughs> M3 <laughs> company was born the next day and the photo actually um which I just actually changed on our um kind of our story or our about us page on our website it's a photo there of me with my daughter who was six months old at the time right. sitting at Mary's kitchen table in front of my laptop and um, that was literally the start of the, the business of course she was sitting there you know bashing away in the keyboard and everything else not realizing that you know daddy's freaking out how he's going to pay the bills this month because he's just lost his job um and that's literally how it happened. So, so we had some customers um, that we well, thankfully were able to kind of kickstart the business with. Um, so, myself and my other colleague Mark Lamb, um, we had customers contacting us saying what's happened. You know, because the business literally that we worked for literally got shut down overnight. Wow. And um, we were like, well, explain to them what happened, and pretty much a good majority of them agreed to come on board with us from the start of the following month. And um, yeah, delighted that a lot of those customers are still with us. In fact, if not, I think all of them that we started with. Now Um, I know where the M3 came from. And that's where the M3 came from. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Um, So yeah, three three M's. Of course, we went through a million other names, as you do, right? Yeah. I was like, oh, what if we take the what if we take the word computer and translate it into Latin? It's like, what does that sound like? You know, I think which I think is what a lot of people do. Let's translate it into a foreign language. It's like, why? And I was like, well, M3 is us and networks is really kind of what we do. Um, and in the logo, which you see in the background, mm-hmm. the idea was that M to the power of three, it's the power of the three of us together right. doing this thing. And that's kind of where it all came from. And um, and that logo hasn't changed actually in 13 years. That's oh, our original logo. Cool. So, so um, your daughter's 13 or nearly 14, is she? Yeah, she'll be 14 in February. So, yeah, she's al- almost as old as the – well, she's older than the business, actually. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure when, which, which one causes me more headaches, whether the teenager or, or the business. But <laughs> My money is on the teenager. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I I think I find it easier to fix business problems than do to find teenage daughter problems. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I I have a thirteen year old daughter as well. She she's fourteen in December, so very similar ages. And yeah, they're tricky, tricky age and stage. Very tricky. Yeah. Very tricky. Yeah. All right. Okay. So um, my dogs are now whining, which is really helpful. And I'm hoping my snazzy microphone's not picking that up. But anyway, we'll plow All on right. through. It's the magic um, of editing, don't you? I know. I, we'll get Neil to edit that bit out. Um, <laughs> so are, are the three of you still in business together? Yeah. The three of okay. us still in business together. Um, uh, so, so my colleague Mary's our FD. Right. Um, Mark's our technical director, and I'm managing director. Although my kind of day to day remit is is sales and marketing. Okay. Um, 
I think I was out of the three of us, I was the one that's most comfortable kind of being out there and speaking to people and like being the face of the business and doing all the business networking stuff. So it kind of fell to me to, I guess, from the hospitality background, right? Just like when I worked front desk in a busy hotel, you can have to be a kind of a people person and be able to kind of be be out there and in front of the public. So, um, so it's just always kind of fallen to me um, Mm -hmm. to to kind of be that. So kind of, yeah, I enjoy it. Um, enjoy being out there and, and, and meeting meeting new businesses as well. well. That's good. Well, that's how we met. We were on one of Dave's walks, weren't we? Yes. And that's that's how we met. Yeah, definitely. Uh, absolutely. Okay. And and looking at your previous podcast, the amount of people that, that we've got in common as well that have been previous guests as well. Um there's uh yeah, quite a quite a few people. I made a list earlier of the people that you've got on, on the show. Quite a few other people I've met and actually um I think at least one customer. Oh, good. Hours. Um. So uh, yeah. Well, Trisha Fox, who I think you've had on more yes, than once, twice. Um, yeah. Yes. So Trisha's a a, a customer of ours. Um. Oh. Yes. Yeah, a few other people there that that I know quite well. So uh, I don't think I've seen a podcast where I've gone through the guest list and went, oh, I know. I actually personally know a lot of these people. <laughs> <laughs> it's because Scotland's a village. That's why. Although I do go off piste and go, you know, I've got, had some American guests and some guests from, um. England. I've had Owen, who is Irish, but he he's based in Scotland. So, yeah, I've had a guy from Mexico as well on the podcast. Nice. Um, and so, yeah, all kinds of people. So, yeah, I had to have Trisha on twice because she just keeps starting new businesses. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when she started the coffee business, I had to get her on to talk about that. Um, well, that's good. The businesses that you work with, do they tend to be SMEs or do you work with corporates as well? Um, it, it varies a lot. Um, uh, I mean, people always say, yeah, you should focus on certain kind of sectors and things like that. I, what I would say is the, the things, two things that most of our customers have in common is they operate from multiple sites. So businesses uh, from multi-location businesses are good because their IT um, needs tend to be quite complex uh, on the networking side. So that's where we tend to excel in the more complex environments. Okay. And the second thing is, is that they're, while they're not all manufacturing businesses, they're similar set up to a manufacturing business. And in, in, in what I mean by that is that they operate from, you know, a big industrial type building where there's an okay. office back end and then uh, an either a manufacturing or some sort of business that, for example, accident, um, accident repair centers, you know, yeah. so vehicle accident repair centers, we've got quite a few customers that it's a bit of a specialist area for us. They're not obviously manufacturing anything, but the same type of environment, we're in that industrial type um, setting where there's a there's a back office function and then there's like a, a warehouse shop floor where they've got you know guys repairing cars and repainting cars and things like that um, and they also tend to be multi-site businesses right um so so yeah those are things that are quite kind of commonalities in terms of size it varies quite a lot um typically we work with businesses that have you know 10 computers upwards which where we tend to be able to add most value to, to people and um anything up to you know 100 plus you know um uh typically once you get to that size people will either have you know maybe an in-house it yeah. resource um so they might not be outsourcing so much of it um but yeah typically the that 10 to 100 computers you know across multiple sites is kind of a common common theme across a lot of our customers. Um, and where are you taking the business? Well, um, well over the last two years, actually, we opened um, an office down in Birmingham during oh, COVID. I didn't um, know that. Yeah. And then more recently, the start of this year, we opened in Edinburgh too. Um, although we're based in Perth and Edinburgh is fairly close, yeah. Uh, one of the reasons for opening Edinburgh was actually for recruitment because okay. recruitment's been a real struggle. I mean, um, if anyone else listening to this knows Perth, Perth isn't known as a tech hub, so there's no, not there's really not a pool not. of um, uh, IT talent around here. So, um, so yeah, I mean, opening Edinburgh really helped with that because we quite quickly, you know, recruited a couple of new techs um, that we were struggling to recruit. 
Um, so yeah, so where we're going is, um, so Glasgow, our plan is are to open in Glasgow as well. So okay. we can kind of complete that magic triangle of Perth, yeah. Edinburgh, Glasgow. Yeah. Um, and we've got customers kind of all over the UK. Um, people often ask that, oh, so most of your customers are around, around Perth. And well, we've got customers down in Hastings mm. and we've got all the way up to Dingwall. So right. it's a pretty big, you know, coverage area that we, that we have. Um, so yeah, but I mean, we've, we've, we've been growing organically through our own kind of outreach and kind of growing, you know, we've always aimed for, you know, one or two new customers a month and we pretty much hit that nowadays. Um, going forward, um, bigger picture things and um, acquisition of other mm. IT companies is probably kind of where we're, where we're moving towards. And um, just because of course, once you grow, when you're, when you're small, you know, you add on some new customers and it's quite big growth, but of yeah. course, as you get bigger, um, it becomes harder and harder to keep pushing that, that the stone up the hill. Right. Um, yeah. and, and, and the other IT companies that are bigger than us out there. And I knew, I know quite a few over in the States. Right. Um, it, there's a common theme again where you can get to a certain level um, and after that level it becomes so hard to keep growing that yeah. you know acquisition is really the the only real option that you end up being left with yeah um so um so yeah that's on the horizon not right yet but it's something that we're we're talking about it, it makes sense and it's either you go out and acquire or you get acquired really um, yeah. yeah yeah and that that's that you, you're right you get to a certain stage in a service sector company and that's really how things begin to happen definitely um yeah. in terms of your own ambitions you know what if you have I don't know whether you do if you have a big vision for m3 what what's the big scary audacious goal for the business? Oh, that's a uh, that's that's tough. People pe- when people ask me that, I say to you, I just want to go and ride my bike. You know, I just want to, oh. I just want to spend most time cycling as I can because that's my okay. thing these days. But you know, but no, for the business is interesting actually. Um, there's a guy in in the states, and I was on a, a a webinar with him just a few weeks back, and and similar scenario to us, got to a certain size, started acquiring. His um his goal was he wanted to have a 50 million dollar revenue by the time he was 50 okay now you can say that's just oh, of course it's just made up but of 50 course. by 50 just had a nice ring to it and that's what he went for um it's difficult for me I, i've not seen things like that you know um i've struggled a little bit actually over the last few years because for me my biggest goal was always to buy a house okay and you know i turned 40 this year a few months back and I thought if I could buy a house before I was 40, it would be great. Never owned a house before. Right. Um, and uh, my mom and dad never owned a house either. So I don't come from a history of house owners. Like, So okay. this is a big thing for me. It's a really big thing. Yeah. Um, and so we actually bought our first house during lockdown number one. Wow. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Um, which was a bit stressful because we were supposed to move in on the Friday and um, Boris Johnson announced first lockdown, I think, on the Monday of that week. Yeah. So yeah. our house was in cardboard box city, packed, <gasps> everything. And then the solicitor's like, no, we've been told by the law society we, we can't close completely any house moves. Oh, no. And um, of course, panic set in of going, well, does that mean it's all going to fall apart? You know, what's going to happen? When is it going to happen? Of course. So we had a six week delay. Um, right. But those six weeks were extremely stressful. Yeah. And People that know me know I like my whiskey, and I really like my whiskey during those six weeks. I bet let me you tell did. you. <laughs> oh my god! So yeah, it was extremely stressful. Um, but uh, but hey, it all it all happened, and um, it was the not knowing. If someone had said, "Look, yeah. Mark, it's going to be six weeks, and it will happen," I'd be like, "Fine, if I know." Yeah. But it was the unknown of going, yeah. "When is it going to happen? And is it going to happen? And what if the mortgage lender withdraw the mortgage offer because of COVID and everything?" It's like there's yeah. so many things were going around my head, and I was thinking, "Typical, typical me that mm. I would do all this work over the years to get us to the point of buying this house, and for it all just to be like pulled away from you at the last minute because of COVID." It was like. It was pretty, yeah, it was pretty stressful. It is, yeah. I don't envy you that at all. I take it you're happy and settled into that house. 
happy and settled yeah it's mad it's been two and a two and a half years already in the house you know and i've actually renewed the mortgage as well since then that's how long ago it was (laughs) it doesn't feel like it hope you got Um, a good fixed deal yes i did thankfully yes so yeah so hopefully all this nonsense will kind of calm down by the time that comes around again i'm gonna come back to you Vision of cycling more because often the first person's response is that the first response person makes is the most honest response. And I don't think there's anything wrong in going, do you know, I'm building a business that I can spend more time doing the stuff like cycling. Mm. Um, And there's, you know, the, the path that you're on of acquisition or whatever that happens to be, as long as you get the cultures right and you buy the right business that complements your culture, there's no reason why that, you know, in the early days, obviously it'd be very time consuming, but eventually there's no reason why you can't then step back and have a full-time MD, paid MD, yeah. that isn't you. Yeah, you're right. I think the... um. The cycling thing, I mean, when you say that can obviously sound a little bit selfish because I've not said anything about the family or about the business, but I think when people are asked those questions, they kind of default to talking about like the business goals and like Mm. the business that went for that. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, financially, it's like, of course, there's always people want, everyone wants to earn more money and work less. I think if those two things are always sound quite nice, but um, for me, it's about, you know, yeah, being able to, to have not to have any money worries or concerns or things like that um um but the the cycling thing ties into a potential you know well you know be quite nice to i've already floated this um by my better half actually i've said you know see one day when we retire really nice to retire to somewhere maybe like spain um Uh near maybe like some of the nice mountain cycle routes and stuff so that because i think i live in scotland right so we literally get three or four months of the year where cycling is fantastic yeah. and then the rest of it is terrible so i'm stuck inside yeah. in the turbo trainer um but it'd be nice that it'd be nice if that every day you woke up was perfect cycling day you know yeah. um yeah. so yeah that's um it probably ties into something like that where you know i mean i'd quite happy go and retire in a slightly warmer climate um so but then that, that ha- ties back into business goals right because you know it, the business has got to do its thing in order for you to have that right completely completely and and whenever I work with clients my first question to them is what what do you want what do you actually want for your life your family your friends whatever that happens to be because the the business is merely a vehicle you know your vehicle happens to be m3 networks to get you personally and yeah and your fellow directors to where you want to be it could be any vehicle it could be a career it could be a profession but it's it's a vehicle and if you enjoy it brilliant which you seem to do that's fantastic and enjoy yourself while you're driving the vehicle um but it does it has to deliver what you want as a human being although otherwise what's the point yeah i think a lot of business owners actually struggle to say what they want personally because i think they feel like well it should always be about like the business i was like but you and the business aren't the same thing you know, um, and and the business is there to serve your life. Let's be Indeed. honest, you know, yeah. um, and that's what it's about because otherwise you've pretty much just created yourself a job for life. Yes. You know, yeah. you've just employed yourself and you're going to do the yeah. same thing for the rest of your life, you know. And the thing about it is if you do that, then all the people that you hire, like all your staff are going to, re- they're going to retire one day and leave the company and enjoy retirement. And yeah. you're still going to be stuck there trying to yeah. drive the business, yeah. right? When everyone else is off enjoying, you know, retirement in Spain or whatever, um, and you're still stuck there. Um, yeah. So the, the one thing that the guy um, was on the podcast, uh, sorry, not the podcast, the webinar a few weeks back there, one thing that um, that he said was that you should always be creating your business to be sold even if you've got no intention yeah. of selling it you should always yeah. be building a business to be sold because then he says it structures you to build a business that is attractive to other people um so that if one right. day you do decide to sell it then it's already in a position what he means is that systems and processes and a proper like management team in place um so that yeah it's attractive to somebody else not just you 
you know, yeah. take you out of it. Um, yeah. So uh, it, it was really interesting um, when you start looking at things, especially for people that have kind of, because he's a few laps ahead of us, right? He's, you know, I think his company's doing like 12 million pounds or $12 million now. Um, but he was where we were at before he started acquiring. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he's, he's just a, he's a bit further down the line. So, um, yeah. so yeah, I'm just going to learn from all his mistakes and do, do, yeah. I mean, he, he's clearly read the e-myth, um, by Michael Gerber, cause that's the principle obviously in there. Um, and, and he's absolutely right. You build a business so it doesn't need you anymore. Um, and you yeah. build a business. So a couple of our previous podcast guests have built and exited businesses and that's their key advice is before you, exit the year before or two years before go part-time um one lady went down to i think it was two days a week and uh another chap who'd sold his business he took i think he took two months off on holiday and and when he came back his business was thriving and so he could prove to people oh it doesn't need me it doesn't rely on me um yeah yeah. and and that's absolutely the key to growing a really successful business definitely yeah Yeah. so how are you making yourself redundant mark (laughs) well see the funny thing is i was going to say there you picked up on like e-myth so um and you don't know this actually but we actually work with e-myth oh no way we actually have an e-myth coach and we have had for a few years which is probably it's probably coming across right you obviously recognize some of the things i've said is very like e-myth kind of like so um, so yeah, um, very interesting. And then, like you said, making yourself redundant. And I think this is a pre emith thing. I think I can't remember where I read it, but yeah, make yourself redundant every twelve months. Yeah. Um. So um. So yeah, I mean, I've managed to 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 do that on the technical side. So like, I, I'm not involved in the technical side because because I've always done all the sales and marketing stuff way back when we were much smaller. You know when I was out doing project work and things like that, of course, there was no sales and marketing happening. Probably like a lot of small businesses, yeah. you know, where the the owner, one of the owners and directors of the company is always having to do sales. Um, but then when you get busy, the sales and marketing stuff stops and you come out the other side of it and go, right, yeah. we've done all that stuff. What now? Um, being very fortunate to have a, a, a financial director from day one and Mary. Yeah, so that's, yeah. Mark and myself, when we were just the, the two techies, in the beginning, we've been able to go and do everything and not have to get worried about the financial side of stuff. So we've got someone to kind of look after that, um, and uh, and someone to keep us in check as well. You know, who's not a techie, who's not getting carried away by oh look at this nice bit of technology or whatever yeah, it is, shiny thing over here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I de- I definitely have shiny object syndrome. Do you? Hundred percent. It's yeah. fatal. It really is fatal. All yeah. right. So, um, we are coming to the end of our time, but I have one final question, okay. which is: If your business had a personality or a character, how would you describe it? Oh wow, that is a tough question. If I had a personality or a mm-hmm. character, um, I would. I think because of what we do. Um, I would say that our our business would be kind of uh, our our account manager James always he always says that our technicians are like IT rock stars. Okay. And I think I, I have I mean I'm quite into like classic rock stuff. So imagine like a rock band where like each person is an absolute expert in their own instrument right Right. and it's like our team you know we've got people that are very very good at hardware and infrastructure stuff we've got people that are very very good with like servers and people very good with office 365 and everything else so we've got this team of people that all have are all very good at their own instruments if you like um so yeah i would say some sort of like glam rock kind of like (laughs) 70s kind of like acdc led zeppelin type of (laughs) thing plus you know not only are we just experts in what we do we think we like have a bit of fun about it as well good so, um so yeah it was either gonna be that or i was gonna pick like a superhero with a cape or something but i think that's no nah. no i i now have an image of you all kiss you know the rock band kiss where they have all the makeup and yeah that that's i'm now 
whenever I see you on one of those walks, Mark, I'm just going to imagine you as as one of the members of Kiss. Well, actually, well, actually, <laughs> Kiss. So my son's ten, right, and right. he loves Kiss. That's his oh, favorite band. I, cool. I don't know how. I don't know if it's because of the costumes and the way they're dressed right. up and stuff, but he he loves Kiss. Um. So, uh, so yeah. So yeah. Well, there we go. Well, let's let's pick Kiss then. And it's Brilliant. nothing to do. None of us dress up and make up on a Friday night or anything like that. Um. Well, maybe some of them do. I don't know. Maybe um, they do. Maybe they maybe, do. Maybe they do. Um. <laughs> but um. Uh, maybe that should be our next uh, company photo shoot. We all dress up and as rock stars <laughs> or something like that. That'd be quite I fun. I really want to see that photo shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I do. That's brilliant. That's an amazing place. And thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate your time on this. And uh, I have learned some things about you that I did not know. So thank you. You're welcome. The Entrepreneurial Journey Podcast. We're talking business and building a culture that's kick-ass. Where we make it happen. Grab your seat. Let's have